trace the beginnings of this epic development machine, you really need to go all the way back to 1983, when a small group of friends would frequently meet up at the Kingsway Amateur Computer Club each Thursday evening in Dundee's Kingsway Technical College. Dave Jones, who was the oldest of the bunch, would often pick up and drive Russell K round and together they would dabble on machines like the Spectrum and Commodore 64. Steve Hammond would join the club shortly after, followed by Mike Daly in 1984. Between the club and the local arcade haunt, the young team were inspired by the games they saw and subsequently made, with Mike Daly writing a breakout clone under the moniker of Freakout for the Commodore Plus 4 which was almost released in 1987, but due to the changes that Cascade Games demanded, wasn't. Steve Hammond was involved and served on graphics duty for this escapade. Now Dave Jones with Russell K meanwhile began writing a Spectrum budget game called Moonshadow, renamed to Zone Trooper, which was eventually published by Game Busters in 1989. The team also collaborated on other gaming ideas with Dave working on titles such as The Game With No Name, which evolved into a Nemesis style shooter, and Mike and Russell coding up Splatterlight, intended to be a cross between Gauntlet and the Spectrum game Splat. But the only game which really became commercially available was Zone Trooper, which was also ported to the Amstrad CPC by the team. Now, even though Zone Trooper wasn't developed under the DMA design badge, it's during this development where things got interesting. Dave Jones obtained his first Amiga 1000 using redundancy money from his electronics job at Timex. The Timex Dundee factory also being the place where Clive's ZX Spectrum was manufactured. And in between, wowing the other friends with its technical ability began work on a title called CopperCon 1 named after an Amiga hardware register and inspired by his love of Konami's shoot'em up Salamander, with some of the final game sound effects directly recorded from the Salamander arcade cabinet in Dundee's Reform Street Arcade. He began seeking a publisher for the title, approaching Hewson Consultants in the first instance. Andrew Braybrook and Hewson were keen to release the game as the Amiga version of Zynapse, but Jones realised sales would be limited and refused to sign the contract, although not before Hewson had taken the liberty of getting it on the front cover of Personal Computer Weekly. Soon after, Dave ended up on Psygnosis's Liverpool-based doorstep, and a deal was quickly struck, leading to an Amiga Group connection known as Tony Smith being roped in to complete graphics on the title, after Dave was blown away by his work with the Kent Team, who were a Southern-based Amiga Group. Dave then gathered the remainder of their quickly amassing group of buddies together to decide on a name, realising that a company could be built from their combined skillful band of merry men. Dave Jones' preferred name was Acme Software, but it was taken, and so the group eventually settled on DMA Design, standing for Direct Memory Access, taken from nearby Amiga programming manuals. Even though journalists were often told that the name stood for doesn't mean anything. And so it was, in amongst the other individual projects, DMA Design was founded in late 1987. With DMA founded, CopperCon 1 was renamed Draconia, but due to another game coincidentally launching weeks beforehand with the same name, it was changed again to Menace. But some magazine reviews published too early to change, still naming the game as Draconia in print. These names followed Jones' requirements that every game should consist of a word used in general conversation or be part of a well-known phrase, i.e. Menace to Society. It was DMA's first game and was published in 1988 for the Amiga, with music provided by David Whittaker, who had been around in the Commodore 64 scene for a while with compositions for games such as Glider Rider. Conversions of Menace followed for the Atari ST, coded by Brian Watson, a university friend of Jones, as well as Commodore 64 and DOS in 1989. One particular challenge for the Atari ST version was replicating the smooth scrolling, a hardware feature that the ST lacked. Watson's solution was to create eight entire screens at a time, each one two pixels further on than the last. This was quite memory intensive, but worked nonetheless. Tony Smith was kept on working down south, and he became responsible for creating DMA's first logo, 
with frequent meetups between himself and Jones at Psygnosis' Midway office. The logo would subsequently change with almost every game created up until 1996. The money quickly started coming in, and with it Dave Jones began his passion for cars, beginning with the purchase of a 16-valve Vauxhall Astra. This also sparked him to quit his in-progress HND in computing at Dundee's Abertay University to concentrate full-time on game development. Although, as far as his lecturers were concerned, only system engineers made money. Oh, how wrong they were. Which was subsequently acknowledged when they provided Mr. Jones with an honorary degree and made him a fellow of the university, whilst also launching the very first computer game development course in the country. Happy with the work from DMA, Psygnosis sent Dave a new toy, in the form of a spanking new 386DX 25MHz, complete with a personal development system. This allowed him to compile code and transfer it over a parallel cable to the Amiga in a blink of an eye. This was a whole new realm compared to coding straight onto his Amiga 1000. It was around this time that Mike Daly was asked to leave college due to low attendance, and quickly started helping Dave work on the new project, which would become Blood Money, which owes some inspiration to IREM's arcade shooter, Mr. Heli. At the same time, Psygnosis had given the nod to Menace to be ported over to the PC, which Russell K had jumped on with great gusto. At this point, the team were still working from their individual bedrooms, or crowding around each other's to work on jobs concurrently. However, it was also the point which some members, such as Mike, were brought on as salaried members, rather than earning money on a project basis. To aid in the development of his C64 titles, he was also given a Dolphin DOS system, but it didn't cut the mustard as much as the guys had hoped, taking 20 minutes to build new iterations of code. Essentially, this meant that if there was one tiny error, you'd have to fix it and then wait another 20 minutes and so on. And this was the process used for Mike's first conversion jobs handed over by Psygnosis in the form of ballistics for the Commodore 64. It was in this game that Mike learned to trick Commodore's 8-bit hardware into displaying 32 on-screen sprites rather than the default of 8. A pretty mighty achievement, especially for your first conversion job. Impressed, Dave handed Mike a brand new 286 12MHz PC, which improved things considerably. With Russell's Menace conversion now complete for the PC, it was passed to Psygnosis for testing, who apparently missed the bug of only the first bullet causing damage to enemies. Subsequent bullets would pass straight through. If you play the game, it's still there to this very day. Anyway, it was during this work that Russell wrote a tool called ILBM 2 Raw. This handy tool essentially took the deluxe paint images and cut graphics out for programmers to use. This was one of the first tools that would speed things up considerably for the team, as they each became more streamlined at tasks in hand. Russell then moved on to the PC port of Ballistics. While the guys were hard at work, Dave had taken up the task of sorting a workspace out for the team. His father-in-law owned a chip shop called the Deep Sea, with an accompanying office space across the road. This quickly became DMA Design's base, which the members began the routine of commuting to on a regular basis. Another friend of Dave's, Gary Timmons, was next on the sign-up list. After coming into the office to look around, Gary was taken by the animations in Blood Money, and began to sit in the corner and, using dots, replicate the walker animation Tony from the Kent team had been working on. It was an Ed 209 style sprite created for Blood Money, which the team started to believe they could write an entire game around. Dave saw Gary's potential and quickly set him up in the back room with Deluxe Paint. It was late 1989, and the team consisting of Dave Jones, Russell Kay, Mike Daly, Steve Hammond, Brian Watson and Gary Timmons was now six strong, some salaried, others not, with some other people still brought in externally to assist. Most of the guys were still under the age of 20 at this point, with Dave Jones himself still only 23 years young. Blood Money was finished up and released in late 1989 on the Psygnosis and converted to the usual other platforms including DOS, the Atari ST and C64 later in 1990. It was another good shooter from the team who had growing reputations and scored well in magazine reviews at the time. Demand was growing and more people were still needed. Scott Johnson was brought in on freelance to do graphics for the next game, Walker, which yes, was inspired by the earlier Blood Money animation. Dave immediately began the process of coding it up, 
It was also around this time that the team had the famous discussion that would lead to Lemmings. Mike, who had just received his first monthly paycheck of £272, had seen tiny 5 pixel high sprites in the game Oids, an ST shooter where your ship rescues android slaves. He thought that somewhere between this and a 16x16 16 16 sprite would be a perfect sweet spot. A sprite that could be replicated lots of times and retain its own character, but make the walker look big by comparison. These guys would make perfect cannon fodder for the walker. He created a demo one lunchtime of men being crushed by weights and shot by guns, with Gary Timmons adding a few more traps, including a chomping mouth. Gary also loosened up the feel of the characters by adding floppy hair. Russell K saw the demo and immediately voiced, There's a game in that, later coining the little sprites Lemmings. A demo of the little guys moving was then assembled and during the late 1989 Personal Computer World show was shown to Psygnosis. By this stage, the Lemmings formula had not even been conceived, and these were just little guys walking across a landscape. The colouring was altered to suit the PC EGA palette, and green hair was decided as appearing nicer than blue. For the time being, the demo was then left on the shelf. Meanwhile, 1990 rolled around. A few things happened by now. Mike started on the C64 version of Blood Money, and Dave Jones was progressing with the new Walker game. Gary had produced a Disney-style walking character with an astonishing 24 frames of animation, and Russell was busy at Dundee University. Brian was tasked with writing a dedicated games debugger, another tool that could help with the team's development progress. Not long into 1990, Dave decided that Walker needed more work on the gameplay, and so shelved it, in order to concentrate on other things. First was a series of six programming articles for Amiga format, then a Shadow of the Beast contract came in for converting to the Commodore 64. This was passed to one of Mike's friends, Richard Swinford. And another friend of Mike's from the Abate Computer Club, Tony Colgun, was brought in to start a new game called Cutie Poo. This was never released but previewed in magazines, showing a character called Dr. Mallet, whose task was to squash tribbles with a huge mallet. Haha, <laughs> such an elegantly 90s game formula. I love it. Further games were shelved at this time, including Gore, a hack and slash Amiga game, which really needed 1 megabytes of memory to run, something uncommon at the time. It was in this frenzy of projects that Mike decided to try his own Lemmings test on the C64. He got as far as a single Lemming strolling across the screen before he was pulled to yet another job in the guise of an Amiga shoot 'em up. Another of many projects that would be shelved. At the same time, Dave had started work on an action replay style cartridge for the Amiga, tentatively called the Monster Cartridge. Whilst other formats such as the Commodore 64 had such a cartridge, the Amiga currently did not. Unfortunately, the development of the cartridge was fraught with problems, and even though Daytel, who owned the Action Replay brand, were keen to buy the product, another development company pipped him to the post with a fully working cartridge. Daytel snapped up this instead. During this time, Scott had entered the office one day and showed the team a game he'd been working on at home. The game was similar to earlier first-person RPG crawlers, such as Dungeon Keeper, but something was different. This new game allowed you to control four players at the same time, each having their own view. This would of course become the legendary Hired Guns. It still required a lot of work, but the seed had been sown, and DMA were on course to release some of their biggest titles yet. So, with the monster cartridge a no-go, Dave had returned to work on what would become Lemmings, originally conceived as a sequel to Blood Money. The game was now beginning to take on its own dimensions. He and Gary began working on the basic skills and screen layouts, along with some fine adjustment on the animations. The shoot 'em up Mike had been working on was outsourced to a programmer called Dave Whiteman, and Mike was given the task of creating an amusing front-end screen for Lemmings. The original idea for the screen was to have hundreds of lemmings filling up the screen, all doing different tasks, but this just made the screen too confusing and was canned. Mike was then tasked with creating an Atari ST port, which he set about by elegantly writing a Blitter emulator, so that the Amiga code could be ported without a great deal of effort. This version later fell into the hands of Brian. 
It's in this frantic delegation of work that DMA DOS was also conceived. This would form the disc loading system for future DMA games and allowed loading and saving of progress, which is handy when you don't want to type in lengthy level codes each time. Work was busy and the initial outline of Lemmings was looking good. Thankfully for the team, some respite came in the form of ITV's telephone and writing an entire game in a day for charity from scratch. So probably not that much respite then. The whole team were involved on Monday the 28th of May in writing Super Off-Road Hot Turbo Buggy Simulator, a simultaneous four-player Super Sprint style game which although pretty much completed, never saw the light of day. In between various requests for ports of games such as Shadow of the Beast for the PC Engine on this occasion, sound effects were on the agenda for Lemmings. Initially, 60s style TV theme tunes were used, but copyright issues came up, so it was decided to use anything that didn't hold a copyright tag. Early sound effects for the Lemmings squeaks were provided by Scott's mother. Brian Johnson and Tim Wright would eventually finish up the music based on old classics such as How Much Is That Puppy In The Window and those catchy riffs would form a memorable aspect of the game. DMA design was expanding and with this saw a move to 49 Meadowside Dundee, an office block with space for four rooms. With the additional space more work could be completed and with Russell finishing up his degree course he began the PC version of Lemmings. By now the Amiga version was coming along nicely with a level editor in place allowing for rapid level building and competitions between the team to design the best levels in the game. A whole £10 was offered for each level that made it into the game. Different team members took different approaches to level design and naming with some encasing clues such as It's Hero Time, a reference to a single lemming going over the top and one of Mike's favourite levels for the lateral thinking required. Other levels, such as I have a cunning plan, were clever references to Black Adder, whilst others were just intended to sound compelling. The two player option came about due to the team's favourite games of Populous and Stunt Car Racer and their novel use of null modem cables for multi system multiplayer. However, as the Amiga and also the Atari ST allowed two mice to be plugged into it, it made sense just to split the screen and offer two players on a single computer. The PC kind of lacked this ability and so the option was subsequently dropped from later versions. The middle bar, by the way, is a hardware sprite to cover some of the messy screen scrolling you'd normally see underneath. An arcade version of Lemmings was also intended at this point and it's actually where the fast forward option from Lemmings 2 would come from. Controlled by Trackball, it was due for release in 1991 but unfortunately never came to fruition. As for the main game, well, Psygnosis was thrilled at its release on the 14th of February 1991 and spent ages testing levels for DMA because of course DMA members were now good at solving levels very quickly, making difficulty hard to gauge. Sales figures went up and up and up, with the Amiga version shipping over 55,000 copies on the first day alone. If you compare this to the total sales of their previous games, with Menace selling 20,000 and Blood Money at 40,000 in their lifetimes, it's clear that Lemmings was in a different league completely. Some review magazines were rating the game with the unprecedented score of 100%, which was completely unheard of. The game is one of the most converted in history, many of which were carried out by DMA and it's estimated that a whopping 15 million copies were sold worldwide across all platforms. The response to this uptake was of course to grow and take on more stuff. Psygnosis were keen for a sequel quickly and so with the basic game engine already in place, DMA put out a call for artists. The two recruited were Stacey Jameson and Mark Island and they were put to work immediately with their first task to play Lemmings to get the idea firmly in their minds. And that sounds like a pretty good job induction to me. Andy White was also recruited at this stage, although initially on no pay, at his own request so he could prove himself to the team. The ST version of Lemmings followed not long after, followed by the PC version, or should I say three versions, with different sets of graphics required for VGA, EGA and CGA versions. Remember this was 1991 and VGA was still pretty expensive. 
With the new team members on board and another move to even larger premises on the agenda, the Oh No! More Lemmings expansion was pushed out in the same year, with various Christmas editions following and the standalone sequel Lemmings 2 The Tribes in 1993. The Lemmings franchise would be utterly and rightly milked before the decade was out, with both the Amiga 500 and 600 being bundled with the original game in various setups, and even leading to two spin-off games in the guise of Lemmings Paintball and The Adventures of Lomax in 1996. 3D Lemmings, which reimagined the critters in third-person perspective, was published by Psygnosis under Sony Computer Entertainment, but actually developed by Clockwork Games rather than DMA. But before that, there were several more significant games which we need to address. With the Shadow of the Beast ports finally released for the C64GS and PC Engine, the Walker game was back on the agenda. Using the original Lemmings sprite inspiration, work continued with Dave back on development duty and the rest of the team chipping in on graphical aspects. The end result was released in February 1993, again on the Cygnosis, and featured a novel control system where both the mouse is used for aiming and a joystick for firing, something we're more used to nowadays with the mouse and keyboard controls for first person shooters. It's a fun game and reviews for it were generally positive, although another game we discussed earlier was also on the horizon, which would showcase the developer's skill once again. Scott had been frantically working away at home on his RPG game, and in late 1992 it was nearing completion. Back in the office Steve exercised his writing skills, the same he'd used for the C64 cartridge port of Shadow of the Beast, and came up with the Hired Guns outline. Set in the year 2712, you control four mercenaries sent to a planet with the goal of rescuing a hostage. However, the said hostage is in fact a ploy, and the real reason behind your trip is to test you against a genetically engineered proving ground of creatures and weapons. The game was promoted for a good while before its release, with Amiga Power running the gag that hired guns would be in next month's issue. This continued for several issues, and even when the game had landed for review, the magazine kept the text in, joking that they no longer knew how to remove it. Those jesters. With DMA now in full stride and firmly placed in new offices, it was a slight shock when Sony acquired Psygnosis in 1993. The response to this was for DMA to sign their next title, one which would again prove evolutionary for the team with Nintendo. The first time the team had moved to a new publisher, but boy was it a big one. Known as One by One in development, Uni Rally was released for the SNES in December 1994 for North America and April 1995 for us poor lemons stuck over in Europe. Immediately after this release, Pixar attempted to sue for allegedly copying the unicycle design and concept from their 1987 short film Red Dream, because naturally the unicycle didn't exist before then. And as Mike Daly put it, the problem with Pixar was that they seemed to think that any computer generated unicycle was owned by them. Shockingly, DMA lost the lawsuit and Nintendo had to terminate cartridge production, but this still left a reasonable 300,000 cartridges sold in its first run. The initial success of Uni Rally led Nintendo to request DMA for an exclusive game for their new shiny Ultra 64 hardware. This game was Body Harvest. And if you've ever played the game, you can see inspiration starting to crop up for their next and arguably most successful franchise. Wanting to take advantage of the full 3D capabilities of the Nintendo's machine, the game sees you taking the role of a genetically engineered soldier in a non-linear open world. Reviews of the game were positive, however due to delays on Nintendo's side, followed by Nintendo completely dropping the title, this left Midway to pick up the publishing rights and the game finally arrived three years after its due date in 1998. It was originally supposed to be a launch title. The time span and changes involved in the production of this title left the game's team weary and frustrated, and in need of another creative outlet. Now you might argue that this unfortunate series of events was actually quite a blessing, one that only time and life can spell out, for the title they chose to work on with a similar vision was indeed Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto. Development of GTA began on the 4th of April 1995 in DMA's new Edinburgh offices. Mike recalls how difficult it was to get a racing game past Dave Jones's careful eye, so something had to be different. 
The team had been working on an isometric style engine, but weren't very impressed with the feel of Syndicate Wars when it arrived on the scene and so wanted to try a slightly different perspective. This new game, whatever it was meant to be, was intended for release on DOS, Windows 95, PlayStation, Sega Saturn and Nintendo 64 using the team's newly acquired skills. Originally it was named Race and & Chase, and its progression is interesting. Mike took the usual third person driving game perspective, and instead of painting the distance on the horizon, built a virtual wall directly in front of your viewport. On this virtual wall, he placed a road and city layout, and flipped the mannerisms of the car to move around this city perspective. This was quite literally a racing game flipped onto its side. Seeing the city from the top down and knowing that you could have a detailed simulation of city life was enough to sell the concept to Dave Jones. Production was scheduled for one year with a new team of developers, and within this team many of the game's elements and gameplay styles appeared through natural evolution. The concept of an open environment was there, with Elite cited as inspiration by the then creative director Gary Penn, including the ability to take on different jobs as and when you wished, but gameplay changes like being the bad guy rather than the cops, stealing cars and running over lines of Hare Krishna were added as the game evolved. The game has similarities to Commodore 64's Miami Vice, which may have been an influence but not a main one as cited by its designers. GTA was released a year before Body Harvest in October 1997, published by BMG Interactive and immediately hit worldwide acclaim, helped in part by the sensationalism and uproar deliberately intensified by Max Clifford in a similar vein to Mortal Kombat had caused a few years before. This masterstroke increased sales and extended coverage globally, and it soon became the game everyone, myself included, needed to have. Never actually reaching the Sega Saturn or N64 platform, the game was astutely being ported to the PlayStation instead, and in total the game would sell over 1 million copies. Now this isn't quite as many as Lemmings, but still a bloody good effort in anyone's book. Riding at the peak of its creative output, the DMA design team was then duly snapped up by the British publisher Gremlin Interactive in late 1997, impressed with DMA utilising their 3D MA graphics engine efficiently, and with plans for newer titles such as Clan Wars and Attack, both of which were cancelled, Gremlin wanted to closely collaborate with the existing DMA team and Dave Jones was quickly shuffled to the role of creative director. Under this new arrangement, we witnessed the release of Space Station Silicon Valley for the N64 and Tank Dicks for Windows, although ties with Gremlin started to turn sour, with Gremlin's R&D head having some very different views on how things should be done. These games were reasonable efforts but seemed to lack the shine and passion of earlier DMA games we'd seen. From there on out, things got a little more complicated and we moved through the corporate world of acquisitions and intellectual property rights. Things start to feel less like the fun creative team from DMA and more like a corporate machine. Nevertheless, with the same mind still working, good things continue to come. Wild Metal Country would be the last game developed under Gremlin Interactive and published by the French publisher Infogrames Studios. Infogrames, who are now on the Atari, would then make the move to purchase Gremlin themselves in 1999 for £24 million. But BMG Interactive, who published the original GTA game and who would go on to become Rockstar Games, still had a deal in place with DMA to produce titles. This in turn led to Infogrames selling DMA and its associated team to Take Two Interactive, who were the parent company of BMG Interactive. So now, we have a position where Take Two Interactive owns both DMA Design and BMG Interactive, and from this point on, the position of the GTA franchise looks pretty rosy, and Take Two were fully aware of this. Under the new ownership once again, and after losing the likes of Russell, Mike, Steve, and Brian, what remained of DMA set about polishing off development of Grand Theft Auto London 1961, quickly followed by Grand Theft Auto 2. But the constant changes of ownership and movements were taking their toll. And with DMA becoming known as Rockstar North under its new ownership, Dave left whilst Grand Theft Auto 3 was in production. 
Take Two Interactive would also launch Lemmings Revolution in April 2000, which received reasonable reviews and remained true to the original Lemmings formula. Sadly, with the shuffling and levers, several games were lost during this period, including the N64 ports of Grand Theft Auto and Wild Metal Country. But it's not without a happy ending. After leaving Rockstar North, Dave set up a studio in Dundee that became a subsidiary of Rage Software and subsequently Real Time Worlds in 2002. Many of DMA's creative minds also moved there, establishing the smaller, fun team feel which DMA was founded on. Dave would then go on to set up Cloud Gene, a Scottish software technology provider, whilst the other team members followed their own creative paths. As for Lemmings and Grand Theft Auto, well, they're both games of legend and continuing success. After all, you have to be living under a substantial rock to have not seen or heard of Grand Theft Auto V. As for Lemmings, I wait and hope for a worthy update. Thank you for watching this video detailing the story of DMA Design. I hope to make more videos like this in the future, but in the meantime, feel free to click one below, contribute to my Patreon and help keep the channel going, subscribe, share, or just leave. In any case, thank you very much for watching, and have a pleasant evening. Goodbye.